All right. Thank you. Thank you. So while people file in, I'll take some time here to introduce to you exactly what the Black Studies Summer Seminar is. I know many of you may have attended the previous two editions, <clears throat> but nonetheless, welcome to all of our, our, our new participants. So the Black Studies Summer Seminar is a comprehensive one week research intensive that's designed to produce generative uh, and fruitful academic debate and professional development for PhD candidates, postdoctoral fellows, pre-tenure faculty, librarians, archivists, researchers, and artists. The goal of the Black Studies Summer Seminar includes training and development of these candidates, the support and preparation of pre-tenure faculty, and the advancement of the field of Black Studies in Canada. Today, we are very excited to begin with the first of this year's um, Three keynote addresses. This today we have Erna Broadburn, Dr. Erna Broadburn, in conversation with Ronald Cummings. Tomorrow, of course, I have to plug the rest of the week uh, while I have you here. Tomorrow, we are pleased to screen Witness the Fitness. Um, and it, it is a, a participatory research creation uh, dance hall project by a recording artist and scholar, Alana Stewart. That will be also at noon Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And we will that will be followed with a, a response by Dr. Lauren Kramer McLeod here uh, from the University of Toronto. On Wednesday, we will have our second keynote address by Herman Bennett, historian Herman, Herman A. Bennett. And on Friday, we close out the week with scholar and artist, Dr. S.A. Smythe. Now, all of those, all of our events this week are all at uh, 12 p.m., 12 noon, Eastern Daylight uh, Savings Time. Uh, and we welcome you to uh, join the event right to make sure you get the links uh, sent to you directly. Thank you. Great. Right. Um, thank you. So um, as we begin, I want to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting home, today this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Queen's University is situated on the territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. And it is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it. As we begin this seminar's week's reflection on Black memory, I also want to acknowledge the complexity of land relationships, where some of us are descended from those who were taken from their traditional lands and forcibly inserted into this hemisphere. The importance of historical preservation has come into sharper relief with the continual transformations in digital cultures and the algorithmic shifts that mediate how we access the present and the past. Questions about the Black archival impulse in contemporary life have once again become a central question for scholarship. And yet, Black memory practices remain unbounded by disciplines and academic institutions. Indeed, thinking about restoration and recovery is itself a collective project, a way of honoring the many modes of Black history making. This year's seminar spans some of those modes. As we begin, I would like to um, acknowledge both the planning committee and our co-sponsors. This year's planning committee includes Lauren Kramer, Pablo Vaitia, Rachel Goff, Mark Campbell, and myself, Kristen Mariah. The committee could not do this alone. Many entities and individuals have been critical to the possibility of our success. And we would especially like to thank the Department of Art, Culture, and Media at the University of Toronto Scarborough, the Department of English Language and Literature at Queen's University, the Agnes Etherington Art Center at Queen's University, the Black Research Network at the University of Toronto, the Queen's Archives, and the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. For supporting this year's edition, we would especially like to thank the following units at the University of Toronto, St. George, Canadian Studies, the Center for Comparative Literature, 
the Jackman Humanities Institute, History, and the Women's and Gender Studies Institute, from the University of Toronto Scarborough, Global Development Studies, Historical and Cultural Studies, and Sociology, and the University of Toronto's Mississauga's Department of Anthropology. I would especially like to thank the Dean's Office um, at the Faculty of Arts and Science um, for helping to enable this webinar. Um, and now I will turn towards Dr. Rachel Goff to introduce today's session. Hello. Um, today's conversation between Erna Broadbur and Ronald Cummings is co-sponsored by the Department of Geography and Planning, the Center for Caribbean Studies, both at University of Toronto. Erna Broadbur was born 1940 to a farmer and an elementary school teacher in rural Jamaica. She attended high school and university in Kingston, Jamaica, where at the University College of the West Indies, London, later University of the West Indies, UWI. She graduated with BA honors in history, an MSc in sociology and a PhD in history. She completed postgraduate work in the anthropology department at the University of Sussex and the department of psychiatry at the University of Washington. In her long and ongoing career, Dr. Broadbur worked at the De Department of Sociology and later the Institute for Social and Economic Research, now SALISES, S-A-L-I-S-E-S, -E at UWI, Mona. Dr. Broadbur was also a visiting professor at several universities in the US and Germany. Today, she's based in her natal village as an independent scholar, working through the agency she founded called Black Space, which focuses on understanding the thought and philosophy of descendants of African enslaved in the new world, as well as on community development. Dr. Broadbur is the author of several published research papers and 14 monographs, eight of which are nonfiction, five novels, and one collection of short stories. Her work has garnered awards from the Association of Caribbean Women Writers and Scholars, the Government of the Netherlands, the Government of Jamaica, the Institute of Jamaica, and the prestigious Wyndham Campbell Award from Yale University in 2017. Dr. Broadbur is currently working on a book tentatively called Out of Wales and Into Jamaica, The Broadburs, 1722 to 1922. Departing from Caribbean historical scholarship that has paid a lot of attention to planters, this work has led to a focus on sawyers, carpenters, pen keepers, people likely to be of the lower middle class in Jamaica. And uh, Dr. Broadbur will be interviewed by Ronald Cummings. Ronald Cummings is an associate professor of Caribbean literature and black diaspora studies in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at McMaster University. His work focuses on questions of gender and sexuality and black cultural resistance. His work has been published in various journals and he is the editor of four critical volumes, including Caribbean Literatures in Transition, 1970 to 2020, co-edited with Alison Donnell. He's also the editor of Make the World New, the poetry of Lillian Allen. Ronald is associate editor of the Journal of West Indian Literature. And our brave correspondent is Julianne okot Uh Julianne is a poet. Her collection of poetry, 100 Days, was nominated for several writing prizes, including the 2017 BC Book Prize, the Pat Lowther Award, the 2017, 2017 Alberta Book Awards, and the 2017 Canadian Authors Award for Poetry. It won the 2017 Indie Fab Book of the Year for Poetry and 2017 Canadian Authors Award for Poet, sorry, uh, for Poetry and the 2017 Glenda uh, Luce Prize for African Poetry. Her 2022 A is for Akoli is a poetry collection that reflects on life as a Black diasporan person in Canada. And her 2023 Song and Dread is a collection of witness poems that moves through the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Julianne lives in Kingston, Canada on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people. She is assistant professor of black studies at Queens University where she is joint appointed in the gender studies and English departments. 
And now I'll hand it over to Ronald Cummings, who will offer some opening comments. Hello, everyone. Let me just pull up my text. Um, okay, here we go. For the last year or so, I have been part of a reading group uh, that has been making our way through Erna Broadbury's writings. Uh, this group was initiated by Carolyn Allen as part of a larger project called Off the Page, which aims to animate Caribbean writing uh, in various ways through drama, explorations of literary sites, like doing walking tours, um, and most recently through reading groups and the practice of reading together as a way of animating texts and sharing them in community. So much of that, um, sorry, much of that reading and thinking uh, that we've been doing over the last year informs some of the questions that I will ask her, um, Dr. Broadbert today. And I also want to acknowledge that at the start, as well as to mention Carolyn Allen, because she's someone who is dear to both Dr. Broadbert and to myself. I mentioned this reading group also to situate this dialogue um, as linked to a tradition of Black study, because we're here in Canada. I will mention the CLR James reading group formed by Caribbean students in Montreal in the 1960s who read and reflected on James's work together and whose attention to his writing, particularly his book, uh, Black Jacobins, inspired the revolutionary intervention seen in the formation of the Caribbean Conference Committee, which was formed in 1965, the Historic Congress of Black Writers, uh, which took place in 1968, as well as the Sir George Williams University protest against institutional racism at what was then Sir George Williams University, uh, which happened in 1969. In thinking about the wider context of Black study that I'm invoking here, we might also mention the New World Group, which came out of the University of the West Indies, uh, with important thinkers such as Lloyd Best and George Beckford. We might also think about Walter Rodney's practice of groundings with the Rastafari Brethren in Kingston, Jamaica, and the history of Saturday classes and evening classes undertaken by teachers and community leaders in various parts of the Black diaspora. So these practices exceed the university as a site of knowledge production. And I consider Dr. Broadbent in particular a special figure within this tradition. Her formation of black space in her community of Woodside, um, which has become a space of knowledge sharing um, has been exemplary. And Rachel mentioned black space at the start um, of this um, as part of her introductions. Black space is where, for example, the lectures were held that constitute the volume, the continent of Black consciousness. And I want to signal the dynam dynamism of that space by also mentioning one Sunday afternoon many years ago when, when I was commandeered into singing um, as part of a concert that was held um, at Black space. And I remember this vividly, but also the sense of community uh, that it fostered. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to Dr. Broadbury today as part of this exploration of Black memory and archives. Dr. Broadbury? Are you hearing me now? We can hear you now, but we can't see you. <laughs> Can you see me and hear me? Yes. I can see me. I can see you. I can see you. I can see you yes. and hear okay. you, Dr. Okay. It's such a pleasure. Right. Okay, then. So, we are all, so we are all right then. Mm. Yes. It is such it's a pleasure, to, pleasure to see you. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to see you. A little changed. <laughs> now having gotten prepared. <laughs> Yes, um, we're, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> um, and I am there. <laughs> well, this is why it's important to have this sharing about Black memory and archives. Um, mm -hmm. in, in my, you know, in, in those opening comments, I mentioned the late 1960s. Um, and I thought we might sort of begin there and move forward um, as part of this short conversation. We can't cover everything, um, but, you know, we 
hopefully we'll cover a fair bit of ground. Um, so in thinking about the late 1960s, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the abandonment of children in Jamaica, uh, which was a publication, which has a publication date of 74, but uh, the preface indicates that, it, you know, the research was generated between 1968 and 70, that, you know, late period um, of the 1960s. And I wanted to ask you about um, you know, some of the context and challenges uh, for that research, both in a sort of individual way, but in the sort of sense of the broader research context um, and what it meant to do that kind of research in the first decade um, of Jamaican independence and nation building um, and how that might have set you on a part of exploring um, what you call in, in um, the preface to um, Woodside Pear Tree Grove as issues pertinent to Jamaica. So I thought we might move there, start there and then forward. Okay. Well, let me tell you, um, most have come out of my sense of what should be done. I, I cannot claim that abandonment of children came out of my feeling that this should be done. Um, the Department of Sociology after I left the United States of America, after I left um, Seattle and the University of Washington, um, I came back to the West Indies, I came back to the University of the West Indies, and there was this project to be done by, um, and I was with the Department of Sociology and I just come back. So they gave me the project to do. Yeah, so that is how come. I'm not claiming that it came out of myself. I was a member of the department. And I so did it, but it was extremely important for me because out of it sprang a number of things which continue to spring and continue to spring until even today. I'm still feeding off what happened in abandonment of children. Um, the, one, of the, one of the early things that came out of that was what we called a child shifting. Uh, I, a lot of work had by outsiders. I don't remember they're dealing with child shifting. And this is one of the things that, my, that that piece of work brought into play. The notion that a child could have um, four people who are looking after you. You could sleep one place, you eat one place, you out of order, and so on. And somebody, and then of course, there are all the teachers. That there are all of these influences around the child, OK? So that is one of the, the major things there um, that came out of that. And the, the, the place, very importantly for me, the place of the yard, because um, when the, 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 the hospital where I did most of the work was a place where people abandoned their children. And um, not abandoned um, could mean to you that there's somebody who can help you with this child. And for people who we asked, the people who could help you with the child was a yard. So that yard virtually became a human thing that took care of. Yards as in um, government yards, as in tenement yards, as in all kinds of yards which, that we have as spaces between which Jamaican people live, especially in the urban area. And that sent me no, because the yard seems so important, that sent me no to ask the UNESCO whether they would allow me to do a study of yards. And that was also very, very important because now I could look to see kinds of yards and to look at the behavior, the differential behavior of yards. And one of the things in that, that came to me forcefully in the looking at the kind of yards was how, was how girls were treated. Mm. They were um, hidden. I mean, the fear of, of a child becoming pregnant was so great. But at the same time, the fear of her not being a woman was as great. So that population was left with the, with the, um, with the challenge, how to hide the child from men. And at the same time, to have her impregnated by men, to have her do, do her duty as a woman and bring children. And I think it is a, it is, it is a conundrum which continues to face the Jamaican society and I imagine a lot of other societies. How do we do that? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. So um, that abandonment led to yards and yards led now to uh, that big study of, of 90, 
90 people born around the turn of the of the 20th century because you no know, i wanted to find out the things that i saw in yards such as the relationship how children or girls were treated and seen was this thing um historical if i if if I found this in people who are growing up in the early 20th century, then it would mean that it is part of our culture. And if you wanted to er eradicate it, you'd have to have a lot of energy to eradicate it. Or you, you, you could have the alternative of not eradicating it and doing working along with it. So um, that is how that's 90, the, looking at these 90 people and getting their life stories came about. It came directly from Yards. Um, they, those, 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 those um, people really led me, really led me to knowing myself. Um, when you interview somebody and they associate you with the university, which it is because that's working at the university, and they say to you, we don't like how you give, how you give away um, emancipation. I felt, I felt like a thief. I felt as if I had let these people, let these people down that had given up their emancipation day, which is August 1st, and given them something else that they could relate to. And that, in dealing with those 90 people, changed me totally. I, want to, I, I, I was no African, I was no black, I was part of them. And I feel that they had given me a, 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 a charge to go and let people understand what they felt or what they meant and, 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 and um, where they where they should be within the society, so um, we've come a long way, haven't we? From um, 1969 to um, 20 years later, because I'm I'm still working on the people's the charge that the people gave me, mm -hmm. which is where black space is now. I want to come back to this question of emancipation, um, mm -hmm. but but I I mean, what strikes me about those two early studies is that they're really important pieces of urban social history. Um, and I wondered if, I, I mean, you know, it seems to me that, you know, that early work on urban spaces stands out within the context of your work because much of um, your later work focuses on Woodside and, you know, things about sort of like rural um, spaces. So I, I wondered if you might say something about like what it meant um, or what, what was it like to do that sort of research focused on urban spaces um, in that early part of your, your career? Well, as I was trying to tell it was I hope now, I am rural to the bone. And I've been rural to the bone ever since I was born. And I came into Kingston just to go to high school. But I could tell you when school ended at three o'clock, um, whether it was for Easter or it was for uh, Midsummer, I was on that bus go back home to my country, back home to country rural, or home to rural. So I knew nothing about the herbs. I knew nothing about the urban. So um, going into these spaces, urban spaces, was a new thing for me, an eye opener for me, you know, eye opener for me. And I uh, understood that uh, what, what that we talk about, the um, urban, rural, rural urban drift. I understood that and I understood how it could be for people who had left their rural area and come into Kingston where there's not a peg of, of breadfruit that somebody can give you every single thing you have to buy, you know, that's a completely different kind of that. But it opened me to understand this, understand like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when I did old people, I, I can't talk about old people now because most of them were younger than me at the time when I was studying them. Uh, when I talk about them, uh, there were people, there are people from the urban area as well who were interviewed you know, and um, they didn't have anything much different to say than the others because they had come from country. They had come from country. A nice old lady, Mother Ford, that I had a nice time with, she had come, she had run away from country. She had run away because the same woman thing. Um, she knew she, she had gone to Kingston just for holiday, came back and was at a wake and all the boys were around her looking and saying how pretty her hair was and she'd taken off her hat and somebody had gone and told her mother that she was flaunting her looks and her mother was about to beat her 
So she ran away to Kingston, okay, where she um, where she was training to be a laundress, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so you could, I, I was allowed to follow through somebody like that. Her pain and indeed why she went to why she went to um, Kingston, why she ran away to Kingston, and also what the male female business was for her in Kingston. Uh, a thing I never really knew before, but that kind of thing I learned from dealing with these people. Um, the relationship between man and woman. Poor Mother Ford got pregnant. She got pregnant and um, the what she calls the, uh, the owner for the belly, the owner for the belly wrote a letter to her mother asking her not to beat her because she did not come looking for it as he came and gave it to her. So they, they, I carry that through in what I'm finished writing now, Mother Woman's story, in that there is, when we look and we see all these pregnant ladies, I will believe that they're pregnant because they are promiscuous. There is a distinction. There is sex for sport, as one man calls it, and there is sex. And if you have a pregnancy because of sex for sport, you are stoned. Nobody business with you, neither the baby father, nor the, nor, nor the baby father, mother, nor even your parents. Sex for sport is out, but you are expected to have sex and produce children. As it says in the Bible, um, what is it again? And, 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 and multiply, and they believe in that, multiply. One of my old ladies in Trelawney, on this matter of, she was asked, she had several children, none of them with any resident father, um, asked why did this happen and how and all of it. And she says, you have to supply God's needs. Mm. Sex is there to supply God's needs. You have to have it, okay? And you know, you know so um, what we're talking about, how many children this person have and the children that person have, it is written that you are to have them as far as as far as we folk, Jamaican folk are concerned. It is written something now for, for all those people who are talking about birth control and all the rest of it to deal with. It is written. I, I wanted to ask how, um, because it seems to me that, you know, um, this practice of interviewing uh, produced a sort of fascination or interest in life narratives. Um, and maybe we can talk a, a little bit about the different forms that you've used to explore um, life narratives. So some of the questions around gender, I think, become crystallized in a volume like The World is a High Hill, which folk, you know, which is short stories uh, focusing on the stories of Jamaican women. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about writing that volume um, and, you know, the particular exploration of the short story as a form, because that, you know, that, that marks a, part, a kind of departure within the wider body of your writing. Okay, okay. I'm not sure it's much of a departure. If you have decided that your business in this world is to give knowledge to Black people about themselves, mm -hmm. you have to look at how you're going to give the knowledge. So I've done all of this research, I've done all of this research. How do I give it back? Why do I give it back? And one of the ways I've given it back is in the form of the story. And so the short story comes out. Mm -hmm. um, I could tell you a little further back how I came onto this idea that the short story and, and the sociology and anthropology are together. Mm -hmm. I was doing a piece of work, I think I was doing for a pieces, which involved um, going out and asking people questions. Are you knowing the sociological method eight out of 10? Eight people said this, therefore more people said it than didn't say it and all the rest of it. And I was totally and completely fed up with that because I didn't see how that was going to, to um, raise any intelligence among the people who are living it and who you want to relate to. So what I would do, having interviewed a person, I would sit down and I would write a story about that person. Now, as it happens, most of us and all of us who are social scientists know that you store your interviews I stored one interview and on the back of it was a short story. Well, I had friends at the time who were writers or who were trying to be writers. And I was a reader for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. When I read my short story, which was written on the back of the interview, 
I said to myself, but this is no, this is just as good as any of my friends. So I entered it in the festival and it placed. So I said to myself, this is a form you could use. And that's how short story came into my life. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to. As, no, as a way of reporting. Yeah. As a way of reporting to the people what you have discovered. Yeah, I'm, I'm also interested in, and, and here I'm thinking about the book, um, Standing Tall, um, mm -hmm. which is stories of uh, Jamaican men. Um, yes, yes, yes. I'm interested in um, the, the use of what is called in that volume, oral biographies. Um, mm -hmm as a way of telling um, those stories. And I wondered if you might talk about, you know, the oral biography as a particular tool um, in that instance, in terms of capturing those stories and sharing them. Mm -hmm. Well, all those stories in, in um, that book on men came out of the interviews with the 90 people. You know? um, and once again, it's reporting, it was reporting back to the people. You could report back to them, but, or you could report back to their children, or report back to the descendants. And that is what I had in mind, the reporting back. Okay. Um, and of course, at the same time, I'm learning so much, so much more. But one of the things I learned in dealing, looking at dealing in interviewing men, and even some of the women, that many of them, like me, were not anti-men. We had great fathers. We loved our fathers, and we knew that our fathers. There are several several of those men in that in that um, volume who were taking care. There's one of them who at 12 was building a house for his mother and, and his siblings at 12. Many of them were working at 12 to support the family. Okay? And you had men who looked at his daughter and said, you have too much children, give me some of them. And he oh. took some of the children and take care of them. Okay. So um, what you're talking about method now, um, and I was very, 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 very much in, in, um, influenced by my time in the psychiatry department at the University of Washington and looking at interview techniques. Well, first thing I did with these people, having disregarded uh, most of the, um, the kind of sociological I'm sorry about that. No, I've turned it off. Okay. okay. Yes. Go ahead. The method, the method. Yes. The first thing I ask everybody, what is the first thing you remember? And we move from there. Um, people remember all sorts of things. One of them remembered going to school the first day of school and the earthquake of 1807 mm. strikes and mashes up the schoolyard and kills a child. Some people remember sitting down in the yard with the baby that their mother just make. So this is where you are. If, it's, if this is the first thing you remember, it must be significant to you. So, so I move on from that, from this thing that is significant to you. And when I finish with significant to you, if it does not um, train a light on what is significant to me, then I ask the questions about what is significant to me. That was my style of interviewing. So, Mm -hmm. which is really my set. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a little bit about the, I guess, the afterlife? The, well, can I ask about that archive, since we're talking about Black Memory and, Black memory and Archives, the archives of those interviews that you did, because oh, that's, yes. such a, that's such a rich yes, collection. Yes. It, it is, it is. And uh, my sister, Velma Pollard, who is in language and education, used those, those tapes to, to, to do her, her um, PhD thesis. I mean, I don't know about language and stuff like that, but, um, but it was useful in that respect as a language thing. But mm -hmm. the archives now belong in the University of the West Indies, belong in Salises, the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute, they're there. And they're used, um, the, the librarian who had been there before, older person, told me that um, they were the most used, um, they were the most used documents in the library. I'm glad for that. 
and people do come from abroad and use them, you know. So I'm very glad it's been it's, it's worthwhile to some people. Okay. So yeah. there they are, and they're open there for the public to use, and I hope the public uses them. Yeah. Can I ask you a little bit about you know the work of transcribing those interviews and um, as well the uh -huh. sort of practical things in terms of making that archive? All right, practical things. Well, I cannot say that I could not have done that transcribed those 10, 90 interviews. So we got funding, got funding for the transcription and mm -hmm. um, they were transcribed. And um, I listened and I wrote, and then somebody else listened and wrote the person who did the, the typing in the hope of catching what really happened. Because sometimes, you know, somebody says something and they didn't mean to say that, they meant to say something else. But mm -hmm. you are in the field talking to them. So you understand that it was a slip of the tongue. So I could I could um, put that in brackets, what was meant to be said, um, where, and the typist would do, put that in, but you would also, the person who was doing the, the translation, she would do what she heard, okay? Mm -hmm. And then it would be what I heard. So that's how we managed to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the tapes are also there in Salises, that whosoever wishes to, do some more work on that can do so. Yeah, no, it, it is such a such an extensive archive um, and an important. It is, it's, 14, it's 14 volumes mm -hmm. by parish, 14 volumes, parishes in Jamaica, 14, they're there by the parish. Mm -hmm. the, the story of Woodside um, mm -hmm. is one that, mm -hmm. um, that runs through different parts of your work. And here I'm probably thinking most about the volume Woodside, Pear Tree Grove. Um, and maybe this is another question. Sorry? No, I said post office. Yes. Woodside, Pear Tree Grove, post office. Post office. Yeah, and maybe this is another question mm -hmm. about, about form and the shape of that book, because one of the things that's interesting for me in reading it is that I read it as a kind of community story. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I wondered if you might say something about the work of putting that together, um, but also some of your intentions for that book um, within that sort of wider practice of giving the work back uh, to people that you've been talking about. I want to haul in Sudan Wilmot at this point. Sudan Wilmot was a mm. part of the history department at UW. Other was very, very interested in history. I got it from him and he knew mm -hmm. a lot. And when he died, we decided not to have the usual, just so we would have instead a lecture. And Susan came and did the lecture on, uh, I live in the parish of St. Mary, so did my father, on voting behavior in St. Mary immediately after emancipation. And the people there, these are very ordinary village people. Were, I mean, their eyes were wide open and they were excited and I mean, two women who live far away and I arranged a lift for them. They said, we can't move. It's dark, but they can't move. Mm -hmm. And when their history has been spoken, they will not move in. So it was then I really understood that the ordinary people do want their history, they want their history. So um, that's how we said Patrick Wolf was born, that I would do that history for them. Before the volume that you know, there's one called The, the, the People of My Jamaican Village, which um, have photographs that we can find of the people who lived, of their, of their ancestors, people who were there in the um, 1930s and stuff like that. Okay. And um, there's a term I've recently known, the deep archives, the deep archives, the interviewing of the people. So the people wrote the thing. And uh, it, it just thrilled me when I would take up two youth club people to help me in the archives in Spanish town. And the eyes would open so wide when they see somebody writing something from 17 something, or it, even worse when the person had their name, you know. So it was it was very exciting for them. And the, the generally speaking, because I would be in my house and somebody would say, send a message to say, you were asking about this, 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 this. I have news for you, come for it. Okay. So that they were participating very much in the in the getting of the data. Right. And um, from time to time, I would read bits of it to them 
for them to um, express themselves. Like um, a case, for instance, is um, on the official records, you see somebody called Hermit, H-E-R-M-I-T-T. -T. Mm -hmm. And the people were able to tell me that the same place you're going to find Hermit, you're going to find A-R-M-I-T-T, -T, because Hermit was produced, pronounced in those days as Amit. Okay. So that kind of thing, the field was able to correct for me. So I could go in now and look not just for her, Amit. Yeah, I'm interested in, so you talked a bit about Smith and Wilmot and that lecture that sort of, you know, set you on the path to doing sure. Woodside Pear Tree Grove Peel. Um, and mm -hmm. was this before or after those lectures that constituted uh, the continent of Black consciousness? It was after the continent of Black consciousness. But the continent of Black consciousness did not go into the depths, did not go into the deep as would said, Petri Grove did, and it can't, you know. I mean, the continent of Black consciousness was dealing with spaces called Nigeria, spaces called Ghana, or spaces called the USA, which is a big, 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 big spaces. But um, sometimes it is required to give the people their history. It is required that you give up these large notions and go into the deep, into the deep, deep plant, the plant rather than plantation. Mm. Um, the could you talk a little bit about just the process of putting together those lectures that made up continent of black consciousness because I'm fascinated with that book you know the sort of um attempt to map um this history right um but also the, the you know the the process the decision you know to have these lectures on a Sunday um, you know, decision. gather the community. Okay. The decision, two th things. One of them is sort of funny. I was in the US and I came home and had no job. And I had no, no, um, no, no profession, no, no assigned work. I was the, what do we call us now? Um, there's a word for us, which I completely forget now. Mm -hmm. It's um, what it means you're unpaid and you're an academic, but you're unpaid, okay? Mm -hmm. So I and needed some money. An independent scholar. <laughs> huh? An independent scholar. <laughs> an independent scholar, an independent scholar. Um, the money didn't really come, but mm. I have had been coming, I've been coming from um, African America. Let's call it African America because I spent most of my time with African Americans. And um, African Americans and Africans, I really met my Africans, not in England as most people do, but in America. And um, we were working together and understanding each other. And there I knew there was a continent of black consciousness, but it needed to be written about, it needed to be told to a number of other people. I knew that there were people that I know, people that went to school with me, for instance, we had never really had to deal with, with, with Africa at all. All our history was a foreign policy of, of, of the Europeans. So it I was also helping to have people of my age and stage who had gone through the things that I'd gone through, but did not know this. So this was the kind of people who would come. Okay. So we would have every 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 month we had on second Sunday, we had our sessions and we would eat together. Mm -hmm. right. So that's sort of continent of black consciousness. Yeah, it's fascinating that you mentioned eating together. I mean, one of the one of the things that I've appreciated about um, black space, you know, is that sense of community that it's not just knowledge sharing, but it's being together in community. Um, you know, being including, together. Yeah. including and it's even more so. No, go ahead. Including, it's even. More so in this later, later, um, later black space reasons that we have, mm -hmm. because now we sleep on the floor. People are bringing tents, but the business is it's not just we have to understand each other as well. Um, we are intellectual workers. We have to understand each other. We have to back up each other because it's not an easy thing. We have to back up each other. And we have to go into ourselves together because we too, as Lloyd Bess said, we are the people as well. To 
go in there and to see what is inside. And it's easier when somebody, one of us is cooking and the rest are eating or when somebody is peeling cane for the rest of us, it's easier. It's easier to get to each other when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so that is our style of relating as 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 um as intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Um one of one of the ongoing um richness of Woodside is the emancipation gathering. Um can you talk mm -hmm. a bit about about that and about mm -hmm. Um, you know, that practice of gathering, you know, as a kind of ongoing um, part of the, the work mm -hmm. that, that you're doing with and in the community. I've told you about, I've told you about being, in the, being out and talking to these old people. Mm -hmm. And they're accusing me of being of the, of the group that take away emancipation from them. I vowed to them that I would give them back emancipation. And so I started to do in the participation sessions, as, as I understood it, among children in my yard. This is the capture of people in Africa, the crossing the Middle Passage, the working on the plantation, and the emancipation that I did in my yard. But God is good, and the, uh, there was a new government, and I uh, knew people who needed my skills, and they asked me to do uh, um, there's a word I'm forgetting now, but it means looking at the cultural program that was on and, and, and seeing whether there's anything to be added. Of course, I added the emancipation mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, so, so that is how in 1999, the emancipation uh, activities came back to Jamaica, came back on the list of holidays. Okay. Okay, and then I moved it out of my out of my yard. I moved it into the community, and now it became a community event um, where we, um, we we there's a place we have called Daddy Rock. Where when I was doing the research for Woodside Pantry Grove, people told us that the um, enslaved people would go to this rock. That's why it's called Daddy. This mm -hmm. rock, and I said Daddy would be whatever it is. Okay, so we go back there because we assume that the 1st of August is Emancipation Day, that you would go on the 31st to talk together to each other and see how we're going to work out this freedom business and what this freedom means. So we know the current generation go down to Daddy Rock on the 31st, the day before the 1st, to talk about our current problems, what this means and what that means. And then on the night of, we, we, we break up into small groups to discuss what the, what the, what, what, what the um, main speaker has said. And on the night of the 31st, which is my night, there is drumming and there is singing. And on the drumming and the singing, um, the population took over that completely. In fact, we had, um, I was running at the time, so emancipation summer school, so that the children could understand what emancipation was about. And we had taught, because uh, in, in that big study I'd done, people had given me songs which they sung at emancipation. So I was teaching them the emancipation songs, different red, different beat, different everything. When I went to the, to, to the, um, the function, which is the drumming, and the, there was none of those songs there. People had taken it over, they had taken it over, and the drums rang and the drums rang and the drums rang. It was a different kind of music that was coming out of that. But they took over that, they took over that. So it became a thing, the community took it over, took it over. And on this, that is Saturday, and on the, on the uh, not Saturday, that is the eve of emancipation. On emancipation day, people had told me about how, um, you could hear uh, at the morning of the August 1st, you could hear the rolling and the stamping and the jumping as people in their houses rolled and gave thanks. And in my house, that is a lot of noises made with the rolling and the stamping and the drumming. I don't know that other people are doing it, but they're advised to do it. And then we get up and we go up onto the mountain, a little hill where mm. we're told that there's evidence that the enslaved people built their own church. Okay? So we go up there and there's ecumenical, whatever it is. Anybody who feels like sin, as the spirit moves you, you say something. The spirit don't move you all, I was stand up there. But the spirit usually moves somebody, so we have that. And then we come down to the, um, 
replay. There's another word for it, but it escaped me now. Because I wrote, I wrote a play. Huh? The reenactment. The reenactment. Yes, I wrote this, this, this reenactment because no, you go and you do the research and you write the books. Not everybody reads. Not everybody can buy a book. And not everybody's interested either in reading and buy a book. But you want the information to get to people. So the reenactment gets the information to people. So, so um, what we tried to do in that play was to find the people whose names we know associate them with the emancipation and with slavery and give them parts which, they, which we imagine their ancestors would have had. In this way, you learn. You learn your history, you learn the past, and I hope get a relationship with the past. I was at university with somebody called Orlando Patterson, who never was my best friend. But since he, since we've grown up now, his book is one of my best friends because inside of it, he talks about freedom and slavery. And one of the things about a slave is that he does not have the capacity to link with his ancestors, to learn from them and to develop something out of that. You know, until, and that is one of the things I took to Woodside, if we, can, if we can look at our ancestors, understand where they're coming from, understand what they're about, understand their language, understand the meaning they gave to things, that we're making a link with them. And we, that is one of the ways in which we will free ourselves from, mm -hmm. well, you know, from what? Free ourselves from the stuff which we were taught, which has nothing to do with us. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. One of the, one of the, interesting things in you know that rich response you just gave was the sort of thinking about history as not just that thing that is held in books or or on shelves right so talking about that Iraq but also talking about a sort of um, communal sharing of, of of stories um when I first went to Woodside years ago it was one of the um first spaces that I encountered in a sort of real way, a sense of a Taino heritage in Jamaica, you know, this mm -hmm. indigenous heritage. And I wondered if you might talk about mm -hmm. the importance of doing that research um, as well and sort of excavating that history alongside mm -hmm. the work that you've been doing around Black histories in, in, right. in Jamaica. Right. Well, the Taino last year made me Bojito, which I carry Bojito. Bohita means um, wise old woman. And I will take that one. Mm. All right. I did not know that in Woodside, Petri Grove, I had written so much about the Tainos, but they were they tell me that they, their jump off point was there. Now we've always known, we growing up in Woodside, for instance, there's a set of steps going up to the church. We've always known them to be the Arawak steps. Now we know them to be the Taino steps. The Taino came, Taino came, Taino came from, from, um, from Cuba and from, from um, Puerto Rico and from, from Florida. And did there, you know, how everybody cries when they find their ancestors and did they crying and did their tobacco smoking and all of that. And made us really understand that what we've been saying was Arawak steps are indeed not necessarily our orchestra, but Taina steps. Mm -hmm. And um, we have this rock carving, which was just called one Bobby Susan because she has one breast. But now we call her At Atabe. She's the mother of the um, the mother of the earth. And there's a lot of respect for her now. And the Taino are with us, foot on foot, they're working so hard in the community and understand to be part of their heritage. And I mean, I, I, I step back now because um, when, 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 when the cacique chief comes by and mm -hmm. he knows so much more about the place that I do and he feels it in his bones and he can talk about it in his bones more than I can talk about it in his bones. For instance, when you crawl under the rock, you can crawl under the rock and there's a place where you can stand up straight and when you stand up straight and you turn your hand around, you feel that you're seeing some writing, but it cannot be writing because 
who was writing at the time and who was coming down there with chisel to, 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 to do these, to chisel out these words. But he has told me, Kasike has told me that it is the shape of the owl, the wise old owl that is there. So we're learning now, we're learning now from the, from the time, you know, so much more about our history than we knew. So yeah. it's all it's all moving on and very exciting. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested in that sort of sense of a a, a dialogue um, that's going on and building in in in, in Woodside as well around this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. may, maybe we can talk a little bit about the the ancestral gardens, which is you know um, the most yeah. recent project coming out of Woodside. Um, you know, tell us about it and, you know, some of the work that has gone making it. Garden, the ancestral garden, that is at Daddy Rock. And we've decided to make, to put the ancestors there. Now you know that um, all over Jamaica, and I suppose all over the New World, there are tombs to this plant and the other plant and the other plant. And there are no tombs to the enslaved people. So we decided to give them a space, respect them. And the work that I did for Woodside Patriot Group Post Office allowed me to see the names of enslaved people. So we started to try to put up the names of the enslaved people, but there are too many and we had no money. And fortunately, there came an advertisement from the cement company for a project to deal with um, community. We, we, we applied for that and we got it, uh, $5 million. Fortunately, they said, you're not getting the money in your hand, we're coming to do the work, which means that nobody could say, they never give me none of the work and so on. <laughs> they came and they did the work, beautiful work. Um, now we have benches. First, we would have to sit on the rock. Now we have benches. And now we have a whole um, big uh, concrete wall with the names of the people who were, en were enslaved on the wood side of the state. That is the gardens. And we want to keep it well. And the top part of the gardens where the soil is, is deep enough. We have three. We haven't really developed it proper yet, properly yet, but we have three spaces, one for the European plants, one for the African plants, and one for the Taino plants. You know? So at least people can learn what it was that came with the British mm -hmm. and what it was that came with the Africans and so mm -hmm. on. So it's another part of the history, plant, plant history. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, um, go ahead. I'm just saying, hopefully, uh, if, as it is hoped, that tourists, I mean, tourists, I don't like that word at all, that people who want to learn something about us come along, they just, they, somebody will be able to teach them what it was that the Europeans brought, what it was that the Africans brought. And so, so it will be part of the teaching program of, for strangers who come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that the plan. That ties into, into my last question. Um, you've given us so much in terms of historical research. Um, well, just research ab about people, right? Um, and you've always expressed uh, a desire that, you know, the work be useful to your people. Um, I wondered if you might say a little bit about um, how you hope people will use this work going forward? I mean, both the work in books, but also the sort of work that you've done in community. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, one dreams, communities don't, are always in flux. People have to move out because they want to go to university or to college. People have to move out because there's no money around and they go to universities. People, so, so you, the people who were excited in 1999 to see what we're doing are not the same people anymore. And you have virtually got to work on these people again to get them a sense of themselves. It is, it is, it is, it is distressing. But one of 
of the things we're, we're, we're reopening, we're opening the ancestral gardens this year in, in, in um, July, late July, August. And one of the things I envisage, every time we've had our, our ceremonial opening, we've had the descendants, descendants are there apart so that people recognize that it really is true. There were people who were enslaved and there were people who have children and, and all like that. And even the people who are descendants to know that this is where we're coming from, okay? What I would like to do this year is to focus some more on the descendants. Focus some more on the descendants. They, they do the prayer and they do a little preaching on those days, but I want something more than that. I want them grouping themselves together. I want them shaking each other's hands and understanding that they are the basic, the basic roots of the community. Okay. And then they take on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, I get an idea came to me when I was down in the set the uh, gardens with a taxi man. His name is Barton. And you saw his name on the list and said, what my name doing down there? And I said, yes. And we had a, a nice little lesson about how come his name. So this year, you know, he's quite willing to come as a descendant and sit with the descendants and talk. Gives him a lesson in his own history, that he has a history, his family has a history, and history is not just something that judges six feet. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing those dreams with us, but also thanks for all of this conversation, um, you know, and, you know, reflecting on this work and all this research that you've done, um, you know, over the past years. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rachel. Um, um, to take us into the next part of um, this session. Thank you so much for this conversation, Dr. Robin. Hi, Dr. Robert. Thank you again. Um, so, Rachel, Rachel, I have something to say to you, which okay. I'm saying right now. The driver asked if you were my daughter. Mr. Hart <laughs> wanted to know if you were my daughter. I'm looking to see which part of you is my daughter. Uh, okay, I told him. <laughs> All right then, good. <laughs> I would I would be very honored. So if you see something, just you know, we can just pretend to. We keep looking. Yes. We keep looking. <laughs> Uh, so before we ask Julianne uh, for her reflections, um, I want to um, mention again that uh, Dr. Broadway has a completed manuscript uh, that is ready for publication, uh, a study in fiction and sociology called Man and Woman's Story. Uh, Dr. Broadway, you did mention it, but did you want to tell us anything more about, um, about what it's about? I don't, I, don't mind, I don't mind telling at all about it. Um, you know, this man and woman business has been on the agenda, social agenda, for a long, long time in Jamaica. As a matter of fact, in recent times, it has gone to um, to Parliament, the treatment by of men of, of women, you know, and that has is there. So I thought I would put my little two cents in from the stuff that I have I have researched and stuff like that to see if I could understand, we help, help us understand why there's so much um, distress between males and females in Jamaica. And probably, I don't know, I don't think it's in the world, but there is in Jamaica, beating up, even killing and all like that. Yes, yes. So that is what it is. What I have done is um, my mother used to keep a scrapbook I was very hesitant to throw it away, although it was there from 1937. She was waiting for my sister to be born in 1937. And she clipped out things. And the things she chose to clip out are things like um, how a woman should, should work towards to, to treat a man, her husband, and um, that it assumes that every, every young girl wants that little house with her husband and a child. And uh, well, I mean, I, from the work I have done, I tried to point out that if 
men and women go into that notion that every woman wants a house, a little house. He's had little house with a baby, then they're going to be in trouble because not every woman wants a little house and a baby. Not every man wants a little house and a baby. But people believe, if people believe that that is it, then there's bound to be fight and, 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 and thump up and, and, and fall down. Okay? And of course, uh, well, I mean, I go into much more with the history of the thing. Like uh, there was a time when uh, the man could, was the head of the house, could be the head of the house because he could be the economic head of the house. But from the 1920s on and stuff like that, that died out. When um, women, for instance, education came and young women were sitting exams in the same way as men were sitting exams and were doing very well. I mean, you look, a woman could look at a man and say, that's a dunce. He might be a man, but I don't want a dunce around me, you know. So um, women could be looking critically at, at men. And um, the, 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 the price, the sale price on men started dropping from about that time. But women still still married. But they married and knew that they were not getting, getting what it is that they had, they had bargained for. So there has to be knock up and stuff like that. And then if you look, I looked also at the, um, some of the folk songs like, um, like um, well, I didn't do before we married and go hug up, mango tree, me live somewhere. You know that one? Before we married and go hug up, mango tree, me we live somewhere one. Well, that is the woman talking. But there's ones, a lot of ones where the men are talking about how um, she, all she do is red manicure her finger. She don't do anything in the house. And, and our others talking about is only when payday come that she come and you see I doing anything. A lot of stuff, a lot of anti-woman stuff is there in the folk songs. And I'm asking women to look, look and see if it's true. Is mm -hmm. that how we behave? Because I mean, I don't suppose it would get in the folk songs so much if a little bit of the truth wasn't there. So we have to look and see if in fact women are exploiting men. Because anybody exploited and find out that the bill is right is going to respond and react, going to thump you down when he realizes that again. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing I've been doing to show, ask us to look at um, look at the situation and to see to also note the change that has happened, and that um, we have to we have to um, understand that the change has happened and therefore there's going to be there's going to be some sort of twisting up and shaking around, which we have to accept. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is most of what it is. It is. Okay, good then. Mm -hmm. I'll do back for so Q&A. Here we have, we have Julian now. Hello. Um, shall I just go? Hi, how are you today? Hi, hi everybody. Um, uh -huh. Hello to you, okay. I, are you okay? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so this has been fantastic listening to you in conversation. Thank you very much for giving us the time for this. Um, I'm hoping to do a response, and I had prepared some remarks. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> But well, let me begin by greeting everybody who, who's at, in attendance. Um, so good morning uh, to those who are still morning, afternoon, or even good evening to people who are coming in. Um, my name again is Julianne Okodbitek, and uh, sometimes people call me Otonea, which is my actual name, and that's okay. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Queen's University in Black Studies, um, but I'm joint appointed in English and Gender Studies. And I'm also a poet, which is important to note because you can look at yourself in my obsession with single words. Um, I'll begin by referring to something that came up in your conversation to ground myself here. But my earliest memory, because you talked about um, when you were doing interviews, um, some of the earliest, you'd ask people what their earliest memories were and the significance of those earliest memories. My earliest memory is of the back door, kitchen door opening, and there was my sister and brother who I had never met from my father. And that's my very, very earliest memory. And uh, when I think about why that is significant is that 
I have lived in uh, Canada for more than 30 years, and I have hardly seen my sister and brother who live in Uganda now. And I think about how they and me, uh, we carry each other's memories. So it's not just about siblings being having um, blood relationships, but it's also about us carrying each other's memories. And then to think back then to how you relate in your work of interviewing people and asking them about what they remember and how everybody carrying memories contributes to the creation of black intellectual knowledge but the work doesn't finish there it's about also returning that knowledge back to the people in terms of short stories and work that is accessible so it doesn't remain in the archives in the data and all of that i want to express my gratitude to the organizers of uh, the black studies summer seminars for this awesome annual gathering especially Dr. Christine Mariah and Dr. Rachel Koff, who welcomed me to this space and made it comfortable for all of us in this panel. And I'm really, really honored to be responding to this remarkable conversation. I begin with the word cusp, which is a word I got from uh, Maya, the 1988 novel by Dr. Barbara. Uh, not as a reflection as the character Maydeen was thinking about as her favorite word. Um, those of us who are poets tend to obsess over words. And, and when I find a character like Maydeen who has a favorite word, I can totally relate to that. But I want to think about CUSP as a way to orientate us and think through this conversation. Um, reading that novel, which was set at the beginning of the 20th century and featuring a community experiencing um, different spiritual practices itself at the cusp was for me the experience of being at a cusp because I was also now taken there to the beginning of the 20th century and I was experiencing it with them. And to think about cusp as the Oxford Dictionary offers today as of this morning, as a point of transition between two different states and a point a pointed end where curves meet. To orientate just then by thinking of how we got here, here being wherever we are, and here also being a moment of shifting, albeit a long time, a, a moment, a long time in human time, but a moment in the wider, wider scale. I want to think about cusping as a verb and what you do when you go and talk to community, when people meet their names on the daddy rock or in, in the garden and say, what is my name being there? What happens when at that meeting point. I'm speaking to you now from a land called Kingston, which was called Kingstown, named 400 years ago in this place. But it's also a place that was had the Algonquin name of Kataroque, which itself is a meeting place, again, a cusp. I come from Northern Uganda, Acholi people, want to exile parents and now living here on the land of the Anishinaabe people and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. In my actual tradition, at the beginning of a gathering with visitors, someone, usually an elder, will welcome everyone and then orientate us to the lands that we are on. We meet here today from many lands, many traditions, many practices, many Black diasporas, some similar, some not, again, a cusping. The cusp also as an orientation from the brilliant Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva, who reminds us that extraction is an economic practice and coloniality as the juridical form that facilitates that extraction. So to think about us living in a capitalist time where the work of extraction and coloniality keeps us at a particular cusp, even as we're doing this work of trying to remember, to, to find ourselves again, um, to meet ourselves, to go forward, to continue the work of freedom. So rather than remain in our, our interdisciplinary silos, for, uh, Denise Ferreira de Silva compels us to think with all the disciplines and beyond to locate ourselves in the cusps now of the global catastrophe that we find ourselves in, but also to think about the work of freedom as you're teaching us, emancipation, relearning our relationships with our ancestors and looking around to see, to name, to learn 
who we are and where we are. I want to bring you to the room today also that the Ugandan president Yoweri Museveni has signed the Anti-Homosexuality Act in 2023 into law, which is amongst the strident, most strident homophobic laws anywhere. So if we look around and everywhere there's a sign, how do we know how to read them? Um, I'm compelled by um, the, the Thai no elder that you told us went down to a cave and looked at um, and felt on the wall some writing and it was in the shape of an R. How do we learn to read where we are? How do we know what we sound like in this moment? Where our solidarities and our acknowledgements of our siblings in Uganda and elsewhere. And also to think about the intellectual work that is not just of looking to create an archive or spending time in an archive, but it's also spending time together so that um, so that we're not just looking for understanding, but we're backing up each other. And so that, as you were saying, we go into ourselves together while somebody else is cooking and cleaning and taking care and taking turns and that kind of thing. So intellectual work is also social work, is also work of being together. I think about the connectedness of this moment, this gathering and in the context and alongside of all of, of the events around us, how do we get to this moment? to this place, to this cusp, and to what reckoning does this cusp as a space and a verb bring to us? How do we remain responsible to the people who share their stories as you told us? How do we give back and contribute to black knowledge and emancipation gathering? I want to just say that here in Kingston is the third um, celebration of, uh, we're we'll getting ready for the third celebration of Emancipation Day, the, only the third. Um, so thank you for reminding us that this is work that is ongoing for a much longer time, but it's also complicated by the fact that every generation is different and every generation needs to keep learning, and therefore the work of freedom is ongoing. Um, it's an ongoing project and process, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julianne. That was wonderful. Um, I, so we're, we're going to have, uh, uh, some time for questions from the audience. Um, I've, I've only just asked, uh, folks to put, to put their questions into the Q and A box. Um, but, uh, thank you to Julianne. Uh, thank you to Ronald and thank you, Dr. Broadbur, uh, for sharing your work with us. Um, I have a question. Maybe I can start um, while we're waiting for the audience to catch up. Um, so I also just re recently read Mayal, uh, one of your novels. And um, for, so uh, for me, um, who my my grandfather and my and my great grandfather were both Methodist ministers. Uh, so one of the things that that I was thinking uh, with the book is, um, and I'll just explain. Uh, so there's a character, a young woman, uh, who through the book is uh, is uh, coming to consciousness following a, a traumatic marriage, uh, and then uh, when she returns to her community. Um, uh, that process of, of uh, getting a sense of herself, um, to echo what you said earlier, Dr. Broadbur, um, happens in her community uh, at, while she's a teacher. Um, and so she is uh, reading a book with her students that has been assigned um, by the school. She doesn't choose the book um, and she's struggling the, with the book. And so, and so this kind of facilitates um, her uh, uh, process of coming to a sense of herself. But there's a, a sort of unexpected uh, set of collaborators. Um, so there is um, uh, who are uh, see, are sort of straddling the material in the spiritual worlds uh, as they um, uh, sort of encourage uh, this young woman in her process. 
Um, and I say unexpected because they span uh, Methodists and Baptists um, who are, so the Methodist uh, minister is identified as a spirit thief and in collaboration with the Baptists, uh, both of these denominations are popularly understood as, um, as denominations that assisted uh, post-emancipation in, um, in, in uh, Black people getting uh, land and establishing villages. Um, but uh, in calling the Methodist a spirit thief and in having this collaboration between the Methodist minister's wife, Maydean, the character that Julianne pointed to, as well as um, uh, the Baptist and Miss Agatha, um, that uh, that I it feels to me like you're commenting on Jamaican history in a way that that also echoes um, many of what you that is actually clearer to me in from listening to you uh, talk today. And so I was wondering about that that group of people um, and the process of uh, Ella coming to consciousness if there was something that you wanted to say about that. Oh, well, you say something about that. This, those people, about four of them, the Methodist, the, the Baptist minister, um, all African, Mars Silas, whom we made in the first chapter, and um, Mother Hen, and coming in now is a white hen. I've, very important spiritual beings. They will materialize from generation to generation, which reminds me of what I heard Julian saying. From time to from if from 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 um, time to time, there are spirits that will materialize and will take on whatever form. But remember, it's not easy to get the people to understand. So you have to be there and you have to be there. And the spirit of, 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 of 1838, if it is to exist in the 1840s, will have to have a new body, but the same spirit. And in 18, 1938, it will be the same thing, but the spirit is there, but it will have to have a new body that is doing the work. Okay. So those beings are, 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 and they're not just to stand by themselves as the four who are there from time to time. They will have to recruit. They'll have to recruit. So um, Maydean is recruited and she's recruited because although she is white, she does understand by virtue of the fact that she grew up with a father who was a priest, but also who understood um, genetics and who understood um, that there was something to the African um, past and the African understanding of things. So she's taking her time and they're taking time with her to bring her. Bring her. And um, it is hoped, made in hopes that her husband, the Methodist priest will come in, but it's going to take him a great deal longer to understand because he's brought up in, and I, I, I've, I had some time working on the Methodist archives in, uh, in England. And so I do understand from having the, the difficulty which a lot of those Methodist people had in dealing with the African oriented religions. The Baptists had a much easier time. Many of the Baptists were indeed blacks, but the Methodists were um, sort of quasi um, established church and had great difficulty understanding. So that is how it is. It's not that he is a he is a spirit thief all the time. He's talking about what my people need and my, my people need. And Maidini said that what you are saying your people need is to be like me. I, I don't think I'm perfect. Let the people be what they are and you learn from them. That's what she's saying to him. Okay. But it will take him some time. You're, you're with me? That is how it is. It will take him some time. The spirits are there, and I, I do believe that the spirits are here too and will be with us for some time. But the spirits can't make it alone. The spirits have to operate in bodies, and we will have to be, be um, trying. They have to, they're trying to come into us. We have to try to understand them and carry on the work which they began, like say, in the, in the, like, like say from 1831, the work which they began, the work of emancipation, the work of freeing us, 
the work of, um, of Bob Marley and Marcus Garvey of helping us to free our minds. That's been going on for some time and we need it again today and we will need it again in the next hundred years unless there are people whose bodies the spirit can work, work with, work on, used to do the work. Can I ask a spiritual book? Hmm? Yes, please. Yes, I'm sorry. You're no, I was asking if I could ask a follow up question. Um, I, I, I love the sort of hmm. the way in which your work, um, and here I'm thinking across text, returns to key dates. Um, you know, and, and I'm fascinated by the sort of uh, work of the spirit and thinking about uh, transformations in the sort of public sphere that that you're mapping for us. And one of those moments seems to be, you know, like if we think more specifically about sort of Jamaican history, the Christmas rebellion and, you know, uh, the, you know, referred to as the Baptist War, um, mm -hmm. you know, by some historians, but also 1865 is a moment you return to. Um, and here I'm thinking about um, Nothing's Matt, um, for instance, which is, you know, your more most recent novel, right, which talks about 1865. And I wondered if you might say something about 1865, the Paul Bogle, um, but also the 1865 rebellion, um, you know, and 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 how that fits into this question about sort of historic moments, but also transformations in the spirit in the public sphere. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I, I'm, going, I'm going to try to respond as I understand what you're saying, which is not necessarily what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. I, um, I, want, to, I, want, to, I want to say again that it happens in 1831, it happens in 1865, it happens and it's going to happen, it will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. happen. All the Paul Bogle's work that they have done, it is still going to happen unless somebody is willing to take over from the Paul Bogle. And um, that work there, somebody did a review of it and said that um, I had long recreated history, but what she meant was that I had made the Maroons unpleasant. The Maroon men had raped the woman. But I had made that unpleasant for the um, uh, and that is not the image of the Maroons that exist, but it's not the image of the Maroons that exist, but it is indeed so. I didn't make it up. Before I wrote that thing, I read the um, the, the investigation into the, 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 the Maroon disturbance. And there are a number of people there who said that the Maroons did this and did that. And in any case, the Maroons were collaborating with um, with the English in, in um, turning over Paul Booth. And it was not the first time because they co 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 collaborated in the Taki Rebellion. We have to accept that it did. And I think too, that work is there for us to do in bringing the Maroons and the rest of us together to understand each other. If we have to say, I'm sorry, say, I'm sorry, it happened, it happened. And it will happen again and again and again unless we do something about it, unless we are honest about it. Okay, I, I, Ronald, I don't know if that is what you wanted, but um, that is the kind of thing that comes to me when that kind of question about the Maroons, about the Maroons come in. Okay. Thank you, that's, that's a really full answer. I mean, I, I remember reading that novel and being really struck by the figure of the Maroon man, um, you mm -hmm. know, um, and the kind of, way in which you're asking us to grapple with that history of, mm -hmm. of, of violence, right? As, as part of that archive. Okay. Just over the weekend, when there was a, uh, in my village, there was a, uh, what they call a arieto. The Taino um, had their ceremony for the rainy season, also the beginning of the year. That year begins in, on March 26th, not March 26th, on May 26th for the time, and they have asked to have their session in Woodside every year. And we're happy to have it. But, um, no, not but, and at their ceremonies, they're always Maroons. They're always Maroons seated up at the table, the heads of the Maroons, okay. And I beg them 
not to let the establishment come between the Maroons and the Tainos, because I see that they're setting up to do that. The Maroons and the Tainos and the rest of us have therefore to get together and, and um, stave them off by ourselves, looking at ourselves and coming together. Yes, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is it. That, I think that question of, of um, Black and Indigenous relations is, you know, it's so important and differently articulated in different places. But in Jamaica, I think we have a, a, a particular history that I'll just mention because maybe everybody in the audience isn't aware. But um, at the signing of the uh, Maroon Treaties, I think one of the things that underlies uh, the, t the tensions is that there is a clause written into the treaties that required uh, maroon communities to uh, to police runaway slaves, um, but um, I, but what we were but what we learned as part of popular history uh, in Jamaica uh, is that the maroons uh, were uh, were were race traitors uh, instead of um, people who had both uh, heritages and were uh, were implicated in a historical moment where. Uh, they were able to establish some sovereign lands, uh, but it was a complicated uh, relationship. Um, if, I, if I'm misspeaking, um, feel free to correct me, but I think that's some of the broader context of, of your comment, Dr. Brodberg. Oh. It, it, it is, it, it is. And only at that period in 26, did I understand that is not, it, it has never been all, all beautiful between even the maroon. You have maroons in um, Portland, the maroons in um, in in, in Saint Elizabeth, the maroons in Saint James. It's not always been beautiful, and they've not always been singing from the same hymn sheet. You know, I learned that um, the maroons in um, the maroons in in Kojo Town were the pre pre predominant ones once upon a time. And that the treaty, in fact, was signed with them, a particular kind of treaty. But the Maroons in Akompo, uh, wanting to get power, um, signed another kind of treaty with the English, the kind of treaty which, which required that they give back what you mentioned there, that they police the place and that they give back runaways. That that was not in the original treaty signed in, in Kojoto the Maroons in, in a compound did that. did that. That is what I'm told by, uh, by a Maroon elder. I do not know, of course, if that is true, but she certainly was very, very looked very much as if she knew, she knew it to be true. And the people are people, could be, because I don't understand how the, um, the a compound Maroons come to be so preeminent in everything, when in fact, Kodja Town Maroons, and they are the ones who rose up in 1795 and got themselves um, badly treated, lied to, and then sent over into Nova Scotia. It was the, it was the, the Kodja Town Maroons. So there are also things there that are underneath festering that we have to look at the history and understand human beings and as human beings try to sort out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I think uh, Julianne had a question. Yeah, I do. Um, thank you, Dr. Borba. My question is about uh, creative writing. And um, yes. uh, I'm thinking about the character in Mayo, who is a playwright, and he writes this yes. play that is akin yes. to spiritual theft. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, as you were talking about methods uh, in answering Ronald's question, um, could you talk a little bit about the methods you use in creative writing so that you're not practicing spiritual theft because what's in your mind is to return the knowledge to black people. But uh, I, I, we know this with lots of creative writers they take the knowledge and then they claim it for themselves. How do you check yourself as you do this work? I suppose I keep on thinking a community that I, um, I have 
Would I have assigned myself or have been assigned? Would I have a writer for that community? And let me share something to you, one of my angers. In 19, I forget when it was, but uh, Maya came up as one of the finalists for the Commonwealth Writers Prize. I went to Australia for it. And um, when the person got up the evening to discuss what Maya was, he says, it is about a mulatta girl. I nearly screamed. It is not about a mulatta girl. It's about a community coming together and trying to find out how to work their things out. It is community. And, and um, if I keep thinking about community and community needs, then I am not, I don't think I'm spirit thieving because I am appointed by the spirit to do certain works. And I must take it back to the people. I must take it back to the people that have their comments on it. Incredible, thank you. If I don't take it back to the people, if I do, do like anthropologists and give the community that they study a name so that nobody can know what happened, nobody can be, nobody can, can learn from the work that they have done because they've given it a name and they've gone to wherever their university is and get their PhD and they'll turn around and say, thank you. Okay, so no, 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 I'm not in that class at all. As I always say, um, the native, the native intellectual has to find a way of relating. And I think that we're finding it. Mm. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question that follows on from <laughs> Julie's question? Yeah. Um, thinking about creative writing. Um, I as part of the reading group, we read your play, Ratoon. Um, and I wondered if you might talk about playwriting. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the form of drama as, you know, one way of returning work to the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked a bit about, you know, how that might function in terms of the reenactments um, mm -hmm. around. Uh, emancipation, uh, but I wondered if you had other thoughts about, you know, playwriting as a practice and how that fits within uh, some of these questions of returning the work to the to the community. No, no, no. I have no intention of being a playwright, none whatsoever. But if there is something that I have to say and feel it is necessary to be said, as I've told other people already, if it requires that I go in the square and stand up on my head, I will do that. So if it requires that I write a play, I will also do that. But it's not that I'm a playwright nor an acrobat. It is that I carry through my responsibility to the people. So don't look for another play. Not unless I can find another way of, uh, of saying what I need to say. Of course, you'll ask, I'm saying what I have to say, but I'm saying it in a way which um, some students call head hurting. How do, I, how do I deal with that? The way I deal with that is that there's something called library, library. And if you have a book in the library, it can be there for 90 years. People grow. I just, it doesn't bother me that right now, all the effort I went through to do nothing smart and to understand fractals. And I know that not many of the young people are reading that book is going to see fractals. But it doesn't bother me because 90 years hence, when my book is still in the library, they will probably go and look at it and understand. That is how I deal with, 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 with that aspect of, of the life that I have chosen to live. Um, I, when, when I met you first, Dr. Barber, you mentioned something about, um, uh, about you, you asked me where my research was and I said, I couldn't tell you <laughs> because of the research ethics agreement. And, um, and I don't, I don't have your exact words, you know, at recall, but, um, your response, uh, uh, in pointing out how that blocks uh, the kind of work that um, is important to do following research and, and giving back to the community really has stayed with me. So um, yeah, I appreciate that reflection 
uh, on how institutional practices uh, really interfere with the work of uh, memory and what 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 memory calls us to do. So, um, I I don't know if um, anyone else has a question, for, maybe from uh, from the seminar. Just wait a moment. Oh, Mark has something. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Broadbur. Um, I have a, a, a weird question, but first I, I wanna express my gratitude of um, be, having a chance to be in black spaces with you back in 2012 um, and getting to meet Clinton Hutton and uh, getting to hear some of these stories from scholars whose work I really admire. Uh, I'm wondering from the work that you do, Dr. Broadbur, has there been, um, how do people that you interact with think about preservation and the work that you do as, as a way of preserving some of the stories? Is it seen as that kind of work or does your work get received as, you know, at least, a, you know, as, as art? you know, as something that's uh, making meaning at the moment and not necessarily as art and a preservation practice? I think I'm neither fish nor fowl. I think that's how I'm seen outside. Um, there are places like this where people seem to understand what it is that I'm trying to do. But I don't think, I don't think my, um, my, my fellows, where I was at the university, I didn't get the impression that they understood what I was doing because um, they, I don't know about all universities, but I know that the university that I was growing up in and that I was teaching in has a tendency, has a tendency to have chemistry, physics, maths. And I think that understanding of phenomena has to not see it in terms of that, but have to have, it has to be integrated, it has to be integrated. And for what we want to know, we want to know ourselves. We didn't break up these things into history and sociology. And I do not believe that we really require this breaking up. It suited somebody to break up these things for university purposes or other purposes, the kind of knowledge. We need knowledge and we need knowledge across the board. And if you hide what you have to say in anthropology, how are we going to get it if you're also telling us that there's something else called sociology? I do not know that there is anything that is going to make the common thing, but I work in all of them. I have, I have been in history and seen its problems. I moved from history to sociology and saw its problems. Then I went into psychiatric anthropology and that was the best one for me, for me because it had to do, I mean, you can't, you can't treat a patient without taking the history, okay? So there is a history right there. So, and you cannot treat a patient without looking at the group because the notion is that the, the, the group is as sick as the patient is and it is part of the patient's problem is the group. So you can't expect to, to, to deal with a patient unless you deal with the group. So it is things like this that made psychiatric anthropology make a sense for me and make me try to use that. Because it didn't, it doesn't break the thing down into compartments. You yeah. are trained in each part. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes, but you. as I said, mom, you don't know what to do with me. Okay. But I, I know what to do with me. And that's the important thing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's a good yeah. problem. Thank you. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question from the an audience member. Uh, Janelle Rodriguez asks, uh, says, uh, "Good morning, evening, night, Dr. Broadbur. Uh, thank you for your reflections. You've spoken about what we have to gain from being honest about your complicity in our subjugation." Uh, could you speak some on what we at least perceive uh, we have to lose? Also, might there be a paper trail of your time at UW Seattle? Uh, thank you. Paper trail? What do you mean by 
That okay. I'm not sure about. Maybe you want to go ahead with the first part and I'll see if I can uh, get uh, Janelle to explain. Well, let, me, let us go back again. Can you begin at the beginning of yes. the first thing? Um, you've spoken about what we have to gain from being honest about our complicity in our subjugation. Could you speak some on what we at least perceive we have to lose? We have to lose. I, I just don't see that we have anything to lose. I don't see that we have anything to lose. Um, I, I said recently that the novel that gave me the worst, the most problem was The Rainmaker's Mistake because I was trying to write about, I was trying to point us to the fact that we have been complicit in our um, degradation and all like that, okay. Um, if you've read, if you read that work, you will see that although the master ran away, I mean, had to leave them and left them, these people are sitting down waiting for him to come back. I, I, I wanted to, I think I should have developed that some, some more. I mean, I don't think it is as clear as I would like it to be which probably is why the question arises about um, what do you have to lose when you look at the subjugation? Yeah, but I, I, I say you don't have anything to lose, but well, you don't have anything to lose in the long run, but it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to look at and to say, um, I did this too, you know, it's difficult. And if I had chased this man away, then he wouldn't have given me um, six, brown children and run away from them. And the rest of the question, no, about the paper trail? Yes, I think she's asking where your papers are uh, located or will okay, be. Okay, okay. Well, that is a very good question because I spent a lot of time scraping up all these little pieces of paper and these old manuscripts, putting them in boxes. Um, I was going to burn them because it's time for them to get out of my life because I feel something else is coming. Um, when uh, a friend of mine in England said, no, you can't do that, and set out to find a university that wanted them. And a university wanted them and that university, the University of Texas. I forget which it is, whether it's Houston or, or the other one. But they were in, we're, we're in, um, we're in conversation about those papers. And I think those papers will be there, will be there. I mean, just everything will be there, everything will be there, including photographs of me and my son. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that is where it will be, it will be. I have people who have said to me, why isn't it at the University of the West Indies? And the answer to all those people will ask that is that University of the West Indies did not ask for that. They then simply, oh, I get money from the, I get money from the University of Texas, but it's not the money business. The University of the West Indies did not ask for that. I don't know if it asked for anybody else's, but they didn't ask for mine, which I think then I would be at the bottom, back of the line because I'm neither history, sociology, anthropology, they wouldn't know where to put me. And they haven't yet decided that um, this business of, of, of sharing up knowledge like a knife. This piece of slice over here, that slice over there, cannot help us. We need to be much more integrated. So they have a problem, I don't. Mm -hmm. yes. You're ahead of your time, Dr. Barber. Leading us into transdisciplinarity. Yes, yes, yes. I think we were there one time before, for whatever reason, it became necessary to break off this one and to break off the other. Mm -hmm. we are getting right back to it mm -hmm. do you happen to know is it university of toronto at uh, sorry university of texas at austin do you know i think it's at austin yes, yes, yes. okay it's the um, it's the oh it has two names it's uh, i i just forget the name of this of the center the ransom Ransom, something with a ransom center. I think it is, it is, it's, I think you're right. I think that's what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Broadbur. Uh, this has been a really lovely two hours we spent with you. Um, uh, thank you so much for your time and your work. Uh, thank you, Ronald, for your breadth of knowledge about Dr. Broadbur's work and, uh, and your 
uh, always gracious and insightful uh, questions. Uh, and thank you so much, Julianne, for being our respondent and your wonderful reflections across the diaspora about Dr. Bropper's uh, work. Um, so I, unless there's any uh, housekeeping things here that we need to do before we wrap up, um, I'll just uh, say thanks to our audience for coming. Uh, something you wanna say in closing, Mark? Yes. I want to uh, say something. I want to give thanks for the spirit because when this morning, when I realized that it was 11 o'clock and not 12 o'clock, I really lost my cool. But talking to you people, the cool came back. So I'm thanking the spirit for allowing it to happen. This is not even the, um, the, 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 the machine that I'm supposed to be using. The machine I'm using was getting ready for me, but um, I was tumbling over myself and about to fall down the stairs when in, in order to get here for 11, quarter to 11. But we're here and things happened. So give thanks. I have nothing to say after that. We have to give thanks for you. And uh, I'm so glad you were able to make it out today. Um, what I wanted to let everyone know that's uh, part of the Black Study Summer Seminar is that we have uh, a film screening tomorrow at noon, uh, um, EDT at noon tomorrow. And uh, if you, you can find all of these things on either our website or on Eventbrite. Um, but yes, we're lucky the spirit was with you today and that yes. Dr. Broadbury, you were delivered to us safely. So we're still counting our blessings. So thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure after all, after all the stone dance, it was my pleasure. Okay, yes, yes, yes. We shall talk because I still need to open your head and get some things out for my purposes. <laughs>